we're going to look at a debate between two Christian philosophers, Dean Zimmerman, who teaches at Rutgers University, and Lynn Rutter Baker, who used to teach at the University of Massachusetts, as well as other places before she went to the University of Massachusetts. Zimmerman is an emergent dualist. Baker, on the other hand, is a constitutional materialist. She believes that a human person is constituted by their physical properties in roughly the same way that a statue is constituted by the material out of which it is made. So some statues are constituted by granite, some by clay, you can have a statue constituted by any particular subject matter. And it has to be, of course, arranged in a particular way. Is a statue a different kind of non-physical thing from the material out of which it's made? That's an uncomfortable position to hold. It sounds like you've got too many things in the universe. So Baker is a materialist a constitutional materialist. Zimmerman rejects that view. He's an emergentist. So let's talk about the differences between the two and the two fundamental characteristic arguments at work in this debate. The first argument comes from Eric Olson. It's called the too many thinkers argument. Eric Olson writes, there is a human animal intimately related to you, which some call your body. Now consider that animal's mental properties. It would seem to have mental properties. You have mental properties, and the animal has the same brain and nervous system as you have, and the same surroundings too, if that is relevant. Consider what it would mean if you were not the animal. The animal thinks, and of course you think. So if you were not that thinking animal, there would be two beings thinking your thoughts. There would be the thinking animal, and there would be you, the thinking non-animal. We should each share our thoughts with an animal numerically different from us. For every thought, there would be two thinkers. The point of the too many thinkers argument is that there are too many thinkers. If you're not going to identify the person with the animal in question, you're going to have two thinking things. You don't want two thinking. You want one thing that is doing the thinking. That's an important argument, and we'll have to see its significance for the debate in question. There's one other argument due to Roderick Chisholm. Chisholm's argument is the Antia successiva argument, a successive being argument. Let's hear how that argument goes. Chisholm writes, the body that persists through time the one I have been carrying with me, so to speak, is an ens successivum. That is to say, it is an entity made up of different things at different times. The set of things that make it up today is not identical with the set of things that made it up yesterday, or with the set of things that made it up the day before. Now, one could say that an ens successivum has different standings at different times, and that these stand-ins do duty for the successive entity at the different times. Thus, the thing that does duty for my body today is other than the thing that did duty for it yesterday, and other than the thing that will do duty for it tomorrow. But what of me? Am I an entity such that different things do duty for me at different days? Is it one thing? that does my feeling depressed for me today and another thing that did it yesterday and still another thing that will do it tomorrow? If I happen to be feeling sad, then surely there is no other thing that is doing my feeling sad for me. We must reject the view that persons are thus entia successiva. Both of these arguments focus differently on the worry that there are too many things in the picture. The too many thinkers argument 
wants you to reject the idea that you could be different from the thing that is an animal. Chisholm's argument rejects the view that the body and what constitutes it could be identified with you, because that would be one too many things. Then there would be something that is standing in for you at various times across your history. You know that your body has physical parts that keep changing. Cells come and go, so the set of things that call them the cell, it doesn't matter what particular scientific entity we're talking about, but let's focus on cells for the moment. Cells come and go, so the set of cells that constitutes your body at one particular point in time isn't the same as the set at a different time. So the set is, according to Chisholm, standing in for your body. He wants to know, is there anything standing in for you of the same sort when it comes to your feeling sad or depressed? He rejects that idea. There isn't any other thing doing stand-in for you at that point. It's just you. So you aren't a successive being. You are not the sort of thing that different physical constellations constitute at different points in time. Notice the Chisholm argument is directly aimed at the kind of constitutional materialism that Baker is going to defend. So Baker has to have something to say about the successive being argument. What reason does she have for preferring the statue and clay analogy as the right way to think about the relationship between mind and body to the emergent dualism position of Zimmer? Baker's main argument is a simplicity argument. If you can posit just one thing, don't bother positing two. Simplicity wins out. Some people refer to this as Occam's razor. The simplicity argument is a forceful one. It is countered, however, by the other two arguments and the relationship between them. Baker can agree with Olson. You don't want there to be more than one thinker, and constitutional materialism gives you a way of defending physicalism in a way that perhaps can evade the too many thinkers argument. But it doesn't do anything to evade the Chisholm argument. You are now going to be a successive being because you're just constituted by different collections of cells from one moment to another. You are like a statue where some pieces keep breaking off and the repairman keeps coming back and putting different physical pieces in place to maintain the same statue. Baker's hope, then, is to weave an intricate path between the Chisholm argument on the one hand, and the Olson argument on the other hand. This leads Dean Zimmerman to object to her view, claiming that the only way to do what she's trying to do in response to the too many thinkers argument is going to land her in a dualistic position. He writes this, when confronted with too many minds, Baker makes derivative having of properties sound very second class. The fact that Y has such properties at T derivatively is not a different fact from the fact that X has them at T and X constitutes Y at T. Let's pause the quote right there for a moment. The distinction between derivative and non-derivative is just this. The fact that one thing has a feature is precisely the same fact as the fact that the other thing has a feature and the other thing constitutes the former thing. Those facts are not different at all. The facts are the same thing. That's her view. Zimmerman claims there's something second class thing about this. Let's see what he wants to say. The animal constituting me thinks the same thought that I do solely in virtue of constituting something that has the thought non-derivatively. But if such use of the derivative-non-derivative distinction lays to rest the too many minds, it turns her view into substance dualism. If non-derivative having of properties is real, 
and derivative having of properties is merely borrowing them in virtue of intimate ties to things that really have them, then persons are not really physical or biological beings. Aggregates of matter are non-derivatively heavy, made of particles spatially located, etc. Organisms non-derivatively digest food, grow, etc. Persons only have these properties or do these things by courtesy. They may truly be said to be heavy or growing solely in virtue of constitution relations to things that are heavy or growing, but only in something like the way a hermit crab may truly be said to be white or beautiful in virtue of its intimate relations to the white or beautiful shell it happens to have borrowed at the moment. A Cartesian dualist will typically allow that, although I am a non-physical soul, in ordinary contexts, I may truly be said to be heavy or growing in virtue of being united with a body that is heavy or growing. Wherein lies the difference between Baker and the dualist? Zimmerman issues a challenge to Baker. Baker appealed to a derivative, non-derivative distinction. That distinction is a distinction Zimmerman takes very seriously. It's the distinction between the basic properties and the emerging features that give rise to his particular version of emergent dualism. These properties emerge. Baker wants to deflate the distinction. She wants to say, the properties really aren't any different because the facts that they constitute are really the same facts. The Zimmerman doesn't like this view and says that he thinks this threatens to generate substance dualism. The argument he gives is a bit perplexing though. Think about how the argument is supposed to work. So, let me recite again the key claim in the quote. Persons are said to be heavier growing solely in virtue of constitution relations to things that are heavier growing. Once he gets to that point in the argument, he then talks about the hermit crab. He says, everything that Baker said can be true, but only in the sense in which you say something about the hermit crab and the shell that it happens to occupy. Notice the hedging language. In something like the way a hermit crab can be said to be white or beautiful. Maybe that's right and maybe it's not. It's not a decisive, compelling consideration because it's not clear what the in something like the way claim comes to. If it were exactly the way in which a hermit crab can be said to be white or beautiful, that might be a thing for Baker to worry about. But notice that Zimmerman doesn't say that. He says in something like the way, but it's not easy to see from what Zimmerman wrote why Baker's position commits Baker to that view. The last issue to talk about is the argument that Baker brings up against emergent dualism or any other form of dualism. And it's an instructive, interesting thing to consider. Baker wants to know, if you're a dualist, let's assume we're talking about emergent dualism. What is a person? Suppose you think a person, you've got persons, you've got souls, you've got bodies, and you've got the soul body composite. Is the person just the soul, or is it the soul-body composite? Which is it? Baker holds that it can't be the latter. It can't be the soul-body composite. Since then, the afterlife would require you to have the same body. So how would that work? Uh, consider all of the what, physical parts that constituted your body. Take the set of cells that constituted your body at your death. In the afterlife, do all of those cells have to come back, coalesce together into a living organism? 
in order for it to be you, the same person in the afterlife? How are you supposed to think about that? Baker's argument is you're in trouble on emergent dualism if you identify the person with the soul body composite. So suppose you go the other way. Suppose you identify the person with the soul. Then Baker says there's no advantage to emergent dualism over my own constitution view because I can do the same sort of thing. So if there's no advantage for emergent dualism and only problems on the horizon, maybe we should just go with the simplicity argument. This is an interesting debate in Christian thought because if anything, you would have thought that central to Christian metaphysics is some distinction between persons and their bodies that is dualistic in character. From the Zimmerman-Baker debate, it's not clear that that position on Christian metaphysics is correct, and it's not even clear that the leading candidate is going to be a version of dualism at all. Baker's materialist position, or other ones like it, might actually have an advantage over dualist positions and might make Christian metaphysics comport better with contemporary outlooks in science.